Here's what's coming up on episode 90 of the Big Seance Podcast. Danielle M. Holdman, Part 1. I just help bridge the physical and spiritual and help open people's perception to that it is real within you, your inner verse, your outer verse, what's above is so below, the physical and the spiritual, all that is interconnected if you choose to acknowledge it and you're not alone. So just like you can ask me for help or guidance, you can also ask those in the water spirit that you feel close to for guidance. I'm an introvert and I don't know about you guys, but I don't even like people stopping by without giving me a call. <laughs> you know, I'm about family and friends giving me a call or a heads up so I can at least straighten mm-hmm. up the house a little bit, you know, or get mentally prepared. So why would you do that if you don't, why would you invite any type of spirit? And not all things spiritual is of, of, of the higher vibration. Let's keep it real. Why would you invite that into your sacred space? Mm-hmm. You have to be mindful, you know, because... Yeah. Yeah, you don't want people putting their feet up on the couch and dirting up your rugs. You don't want this, like, you know, you wouldn't want that. So why would you don't want them dirting up your energetic space? I mean, there's not enough sage in the world that can really clear all that out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I talked to them like they're next to me. And I said, you, you mentioned one time you said, like, you're on Google Hangouts. And I <laughs> almost peed my pants. I thought that was so funny that you're chilling out with your ancestors and spirit guides on Google Hangouts. That's yeah. awesome. I'd love that. That would be amazing. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. When I connected with Danielle M. Holdman recently, we had planned on about an hour for conversation, which is what usually happens, about an hour. Well, our conversation, if you count the hour after we ended the interview, was well over three hours, and we could have kept going even. The energy was so great that time just seemed to disappear. One of Danielle's passions happens to be tarot, and you'll be happy to know that she was open and willing to share a reading for us at the end of our interview. So that'll actually be next time in part two, so you can look forward to that. I want to get right to it today. A little later, we'll have a sneak peek of part two, we'll have some listener feedback and a brand new spectral edition from Tim Prossel. So get that tea poured. San Francisco Bay Area native and self-proclaimed personal business, and spiritual alchemist, Danielle M. Holdman is a certified professional coach, motivation, and soul empowerment speaker, certified metaphysical and NLP practitioner. Using a variety of modalities ranging from the mundane to the metaphysical, she holistically assists individuals to integrate spiritual and practical alchemy into one's life, mission, relationships, career journey, self-employment evolution, and more. Danielle is host of the Coaching Parlor podcast, which I've been listening to quite a bit lately, and Parlor Sessions on YouTube. With a vast professional background spanning over 12 plus years in marketing, media, entrepreneurship, and traditional and digital publishing, she approaches mundane living, coaching, counseling, and creative projects with a dash of sass, funk, soul, and magic, all with the help of her ancestors and spirit guides. To learn more about Danielle, her mission, vision, values, and goals, please visit Danielle Holdman, 
dot com. So Danielle, you're leaving your beautiful parlor to visit another parlor today. Welcome. <laughs> yes. Coffee Welcome Cubs to- Muck. Welcome. Well, nice. Well, welcome. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I was going to ask you what I can offer you to drink, but what do you already have to drink there? I have some Colombian coffee, the dark okay. roast uh, from Costco with a little bit of French vanilla cream. And uh, I know I should leave. Oh, well, actually, coconut sugar. Ooh, <laughs> we could we could evolve this whole what do you want to drink in my episodes and to give us the recipe for your <laughs> concoction. <laughs> that sounds beautiful. I'm chilling with some coffee, too. It's okay. uh, probably some eight o'clock um, hazelnut blend with mm. some Splenda and uh, generic powdered creamer. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny because I have to have my coffee flavored. Uh huh. I can't really do coffee by itself. As much as I love coffee, mm-hmm. I know the coffee aficionados are like, oh, you take coffee however. No, but seriously, <laughs> I like to have my coffee a little bit flavored. Yeah. And normally I have like my teas and stuff like in the afternoon um, if it's after 2 o'clock because I normally don't like to have coffee after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, for it's, it's just a thing for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but yes, thank you for having me in your parlor. Don't you love parlors? I do love parlors. Just the visual is all I need, <laughs> you know? Um, you, it wasn't until I started blogging around 2012 that I became aware of what we usually know as life coaches, you know? And I thought it was very interesting. And I've got some podcaster friends who recently have made references to work they've done with their life coaches, but I've never really picked anyone's brain about their experiences and, and what's it's all about. Well, you are a, among other things, you know, you're a certified coach, but it's very clear that you're so much more than that. And I've been listening to your podcast for a while now, and it's also recently evolved a bit and we can go into that. I know you have a passion for business and marketing, but also the spiritual world, which is, you know, that's what, because I am i don't have a marketing podcast or business, pod, <laughs> business podcast, but the spiritual world. Yeah. Can you please tell us, first of all, because I, you know, not everyone knows maybe, but what traditional coaching is, but then go into how all of your passions combine to make your style very unique. Mm, okay. So coaching, I could tell you what coaching is not. Coaching is not giving you the answers. Coaching is not helping you. It is helping you, uh, helping an individual solve an issue, but a coach doesn't do it for them. A coach is there to hold you accountable for what you're, what you uh, want to accomplish as far as uh, working towards your goal. A coach is there to help ask the right questions, to help you figure things out so it comes it's different from how how they say when you if you were to ask me um, to do something for you versus you doing it for yourself, don't you value it more when you do it for yourself? Because as you go through the process, you're exper- you're learning through your experience and it's touching all types all all, all of your senses. Though it's going to help when you're doing things, you're 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 learning, you're thinking things through, you're feeling it, you're touching it, you're experiencing it, your your emotions are carrying you through the um the process. And so you value it more versus me telling you what you need to do or telling you giving you the answers. You're gonna be like, oh okay. Okay. You take it for face value. But when you when an individual comes to the conclusion and the answers with the guidance and the accountability, they value more and it makes more of a change. Like I said, is there a, a coach is going to not sugar? Well, how to say? It? I don't want to say sugar coat, but they're not a yes person. A coach is going to hold you accountable if you said you're going, to, and in a respectful way. They're not. I'm not saying they're going to go and bark orders at you like you're a sergeant, but they're or like you're at the you gym. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, th- that's a different type. That's a health yeah. <laughs> fitness coach. So they're going to keep. Have you noticed? Fitness instructor or coaches, they're very, they're not like, okay, you didn't, you didn't, it's all right. They're very like, okay, you said you were going to do this. Why didn't you do it? Mm -hmm. And that's how a coach is. It's like, you said you wanted to accomplish a goal. 
and you said you were going to do this, this, and that, and you didn't do it. What is what is what is the reason why? Don't give any excuses because I'm here. I don't want to waste. I don't want us wasting wasting each other's time, uh, because I feel for me that we're all here for a mission. We're all here for a reason, and I'm here to help you. And I, I really love helping people. Uh, recognize their own strengths, their own gifts, that they have the ability to make changes in their lives. I feel that the way I do approach coaching is about disrupting a pattern. It's uh, disrupting a certain energetic pattern. Because we all, that's what habits, habits and, um, see, I hate when, I hate when words don't come to your mind when you, when you really need it, but habits and behaviors, yes. There you go. <laughs> It's a certain energetic signature that we're existing in, and sometimes that energetic signature isn't the best for us. And when a person comes for a coach, uh, for coaching, sometimes they try to do things by themselves, but they're not as disciplined. And they don't, you know, it's it's different for, and some people are really type A personalities where they don't need the systems at all. They, they say they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it, and that's fine. But a lot of people, life gets in the way, you know, relationships get in the way of what they want to do, and they need that outside person, someone who probably doesn't really know them that well. So, so it's really harder to really flake. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to hold them accountable. That can help guide them in the right direction. That can bring, like a lot of people who know me personally or who have worked with me, say I'm very resourceful, and I love being resourceful. I love presenting resources to individuals that can help them help move them forward. And how I approach coaching, and I know you said it's different. My background, my trade, as you say, mm -hmm. I did go to school for business and marketing. And it's so funny, Patrick, because originally when I started off with my, my college career and even high school, I've always said that I was going to move to New York and I was going to work in the entertainment industry. And I was going to have, you know, because I grew up around the time, the late 90s, well, mid to, to late 90s, where... I was really big on the hip hop scene and R and B. This the whole music industry. It's totally it's vastly different from now. Vastly mm -hmm. different. So I always thought I was going to uh, be in this corporate environment, and I did do that. I worked at a core. I did, worked at a couple of Fortune 500 companies, and I did all that. But I realized that wasn't the direction I needed to go in. I am more of a entrepreneur, and that's what I've done. And then I got into digital marketing. I had my own online magazine back in 2008 because I got laid off during that whole big thing in 2008. But that was a great experience because, it's, it, you know, starting something online, as you know, it is a little hard. It, it is exciting. Barrier entry is low. It's a new terrain, a new frontier, but it is hard. And I realized I was going through so I was having a lot of breakdowns, you know, just fought the layoff and starting a new business and it's when you have to let go and let I always say let the universe select the let your guides of the divine guide you in the direction you need to go into then after I moved back from New York back to the Bay Area because I lived in New York for 12 years on New York New Jersey I came across uh well actually I already came across this in 2006 mm -hmm. um just a, a, as my own spiritual path but a with a box of tarot cards, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and but I, I but I let it go, and a little bit while I was working at these corporate companies or what they're doing, I, my spiritual path has always um, I was more of a spiritualist and more um, into uh, alternative spirituality, as some people would call it. So I did work fluidly with those in the word of spirit. And it's second nature for me. <laughs> it's normal for me. Um, meditation. I was I was working with. I even have them here. I was working with my uh, crystals and stones. <laughs> nice. Before it's been trendy, you know, because uh -huh. you know everyone's doing it now. I was working with sage before it was trendy. And those in, in your audience, they know what I'm talking about. Everyone's mm -hmm. doing it now. It's a trend. But I've been working with that since I was 18. You know, and so I've been working with these for a while. So. I noticed it fast forward over 10 years, I was just sitting there. I was like, you know what? Let me play with, let me play around with these tarot and Oracle decks. And I think I realized it was real to me. 
because let me tell you an incident, a, a situation before Patrick. I know I'm we're going on tangents. Let me tell you real quick about your audience. I go on tangents. tangent it up. <laughs> Let's tangent it up. That's okay. Right. Okay. So this was two months before I heavily got into to roll an Oracle decks. And I was at a low point. I had moved back, you know, to California with my mom and stuff. And I was in the bedroom and I was like, you know what? Let me, let me just play around. Let me ask a couple of questions. So uh, at the time I had one of those Doreen virtue decks, the Senate master ones. And I asked a question and I remember saying this, I said, well, guides, if you're here, Give me a sign that is very loud and clear that you're listening to me at this moment. So I asked a question and I said, give me a sign. This was at 10 o'clock at night. Right when I said, give me a sign. Why were birds chirping? Birds do not, I mean, for the most part, birds do not chirp like, like right on cue. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, right on cue, the birds were chirping, giving me a sign that they like someone was around. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, this is interesting. So I was, you know, flipping them over some more cards, playing, dealing some more cards. I said, well, give me another side that you, that you're definitely, definitely listening. And I, I test, I do test, mm-hmm. you know, so just to see if, if, it's, if it's, if they are truly genuinely around me, the birds chirped again, right on cue. So I know for one, another person was like, well, that's a coincidence to me. That was not a coincidence. That was spirit working through these birds at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night like they were chirping like it was seven o'clock or eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. Something's around me. And I've always known that spirits were around me. Um, and like I said, it's going, I'm, I'm, I'm really all this back to how this deals with my type of coaching. Um, even when, when I was living in Jersey in my apartment across the street from a cemetery. <laughs> oh gosh. Really bothered me. It did bother me, but my, my bedroom window faced the cemetery <laughs> but um <laughs> you got to be confident to, to, <laughs> to just let that be your view <laughs> you know but <laughs> full moon over the cemetery mm-hmm. no but um i would hear things in my in my apartment you know i would have experiences uh some would call it astral experience where i was very conscious of what were lucid dreaming uh i was very conscious of something visiting me in my sleep and having it confirmed by uh, a medium like yeah that they with them telling me that and been like yeah so that's what that blue light and I felt like a being where I couldn't see the being but I saw the bright white light and the blue light in my bedroom where I know I was sleeping where well, you know you're sleeping but you're conscious and you're facing it and you see that it's by the vanity looking at you and the energy was it was it was a refreshing energy because you can also sense when something is of lower vibrational because you just feel panicky for me but i say all this to say about a couple of the experience of working with those in the world of spirit is that it's normal and i know the reason why i i I try to bring what i'm what i aim to do with my coaching is to bridge the gap between the mundane and the practical and the mundane with the spiritual a lot more people are becoming more receptive to paranormal experiences or hearing stories about it, sharing their experiences as you have with your platform. Uh, more people are, are being open with things that are non-religious, non-Christianity, non-Islam, non-Judaism, are more open to spiritual experiences or like, okay, this is a possibility. A lot more people are becoming more aware of some type of spiritual guidance besides guardian angels a lot more people are becoming more in line with their ancestors, those who've gone before them. And I'm not your typical person who, we talked about this, that it would be very, I haven't gone to India and to an ashram in India and had a, a metaphysical spiritual experience and I'm not a, a, a yogi. I'm just regular smeggler Danielle from up the block who has, you know, looks different, you know, is a black female, let's just keep it real, you know, <laughs> has a little sass, has a little soul, and is, but has had these spiritual experiences and whose spiritual background aligns more with that of the metaphysical background that, you know, and I want to, how do I say it? I feel that a lot more people are more receptive to me because it's, it's, I'm very down to earth. I don't, 
a lot of people I've, I've experienced and I've seen it online and offline. There's a poshness about, yes, I'm this and I've done this. And, you know, I'm a guru. I'm not a guru. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm not even a teacher. I'm just a guide. I'm a, I call myself an earthly, earthly guide to help you along the way. And that's how I approach my coaching. And I want you to see not just something as your career or as your business or even your relationships to yourself and others is not just something that is practical. There's a spiritual foundation in all that we do. There's a reason there's because how do I say it? There's a spiritual lesson in there's a spiritual lesson in everything that we do. There's a spiritual lesson of why you have the Big Sands podcast because your mission is to help is you, Patrick's, to help bridge the gap and make and normalize the conversation about paranormal experiences that no it is not something that's a gimmick it is an, and, and it is it could be a fun experience for some people but it is real ghosts are real ghosts of majority of them have been incarnate on this earthly plane you know and so it's nothing to be ashamed of it's nothing to be scared of you know what i'm saying so that is like part of your mission my mission my mission is to help people come into this earth, not just get a nine to five because you're you're conditioned to do that, but really step into your life's mission and whatever that may be. So you live a more fulfilling life and understand that is understand the lesson behind all that um, and also hold you accountable to all that and introduce different modalities to help you figure things out and understand the what's beyond what you can see or comprehend, understand that there's something behind the scenes that's working with you, such as your spiritual guides. I don't know if you heard an episode, like I'm really out and open, like, yeah, I got spiritual guides. I got Mm -hmm. physical, I have a physical friends and family and business associates that I work with, but I also have the equivalent on the other sides known as my ancestors and my spiritual guides and and you know and i know some of them by name some of my spiritual guides i'm not aware of them by name but there are a few that i know by name that help me in different aspects of my life i i honor my ancestors my i honor my dad who passed away when i was 16 and my relationship with him has gotten so much better as and now that he's in the world of spirit mm-hmm. you know we didn't have the best relationship you know, I'll just be honest, we didn't have the, he was in my life, him and my mom was married for 32 years until they died, so he was in my life, but we bumped heads a lot. I, I guess you got two Leos in the house. <laughs> you know, you're gonna <laughs> bump heads. You know, but, um, say my aunt, the one who really was um, adamant of steering me on this spiritual, becoming a spiritualist and on this spiritual path, she passed away from cancer, uh, now going on four years. I honor her because she was a catalyst in my life. She was one of her missions. I truly feel was to be one of my guys to help steer me as a reminder. Oh, Daniel, you're supposed to go this way. She had my same with my grandma. So I honor those are people who have been in my life that I honor as my ancestors. I have my spiritual guides, and I do incorporate. This. I don't know if some of your listeners are familiar, um, but with the ascended masters, I'm sure you guys have heard that, like Buddha and Master Moya and. Uh, Jesus, I, I, I incorporate that into my spiritual guide, my spiritual aid team also. So as that may sound kooky to some people, it's very real to me. And I want to help normalize that just as like you, just as much as you may acknowledge that there are guardian angels, you do have a spiritual aid team. So I do actually incorporate those, those terminologies and that experience into my coaching as far as you know, some people may not be receptive to spiritual guides, but I say, well, do you have people, a family and friends who have passed on before you that you were close with, that you know are on the other side or in heaven? You know, well, they're working with you. You know, so you just mm-hmm. have to open and receptive to them because you have the guidance and the help that you need to do whatever you want in life. So that's one of the things I do incorporate into my coaching that does make me different from others. <laughs> Other life coaches or, or career coaches or business coaches. So so people know that you have all the support and help that you need in the physical and in the spiritual. Because it's all connected in one way or, not, or another. And that's, if I know I was went on a tangent and I was rambling, but if I was to give all the backstories of my experiences and kind of tell you what I, what I do is I just help bridge the physical and spiritual and help open people's perception to that. It is real within you, your inner verse, your outer verse, what's above is so below, um, the physical and the spiritual, all that is interconnected 
if you choose to acknowledge it and you're not alone. So just like you can ask me for help or guidance, you can also ask those in the water spirit that you feel close to for guidance. And you will see some synchronistic events that that take place in your life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. If you just ask and let go or invite in the experience, I do incorporate tarot. I do in tarot and oracle readings, not in an entertainment for per for entertainment. Re- no, we do. I do. I call it laser coaching um, readings. If I if you want to uh, divulge into a certain insight into your life or get answers or guidance on a certain aspect, so I do use those modalities. I use Reiki healing because I do feel that um, a lot of have people have energy blocks that need some type of clearing before they really get into it and do their own clearing themselves. Um, I really am learning more about natal charts and I have been studying that for the past two years or so. And that has opened my eyes to so many things, just looking at my own chart and seeing how on point that was as far as who I am and my life path. I personally look at natal charts. You know, some people may agree with me or not, but those who are familiar with that and are familiar with the whole uh, Carolyn Mice, Mies, I can't always pronounce her last name, but sacred contracts, how I do feel that when you incarnate on this earth, you're not just kicked down from the ethers on down to this reality. I do feel that you have some type of map mm-hmm. to help you, to help guide you along the way. And I do feel your natal chart is that. It's not going to give you all the answers because, again, if I was to give you all the answers, then you wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't mean anything to you. It's like a little map to help you figure things more about yourself and how you fit into this this world. I do, like I said, do intuitive readings. I do, you know, the energy healings and some other stuff that I do do. And I also do the main Monday, like the goal setting, the time management the planning, the researching, all that is important because it all works together. I like to approach things holistically, mentally, what's your mindset mindset shift, what you know, changing your perspective emotionally. It's not so much about the goal that you want to accomplish, but how you want to feel. And then spiritually, like what is your what is your outlook on life? Where, you know, do you feel that there is a something of higher power that's guiding you, that's protecting you, that's of love and that's of goodness? It is of love and light. I know it's an over, uh, overused <laughs> cliche and a lot of people get sick of it, but that is of grace, compassion and love and, and the wisdom that's within the light that's help, helping you help guide you. And physically, uh, when I mean physically, I'm talking about taking action. A lot of people don't experience change in their life is because they don't take action on what they want to do. So that's, I know this is, that's a whole. (laughs) I love it. I love it. So obviously there are going to be people that reach out to you for that spiritual guidance or your take on the, you know, that part of the coaching, that angle of the coaching, but I'm assuming then you're not afraid to introduce that angle, that spiritual kind of angle to someone who doesn't necessarily hasn't been introduced to it yet no no i don't what i do is i just ask them what is your expectations Mm -hmm. why do you feel drawn to me i'm not here to convert you i don't believe in converting anybody i'm i present information what you do with the information that's up to you i always say take what you need and leave the rest if you're really just trying to uh really focus on further developing your career or getting to independent work as as a self-employed individual, we're going to focus on that because that's, again, that's my trade. That's in my DNA. Like I can talk straight business with you. Like we kind of talked before we press play Mm -hmm. and that's, that's just a second language for me. But I want you to understand the, at the end of the day, it's about purpose. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Because you can go and do things for money. Does not mean that you're going to be happy. You may experience some burnout and, because you went solely for the money. As you know, money is uh, energy that is very important to help sustain our life on this earthly plane. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so we can't ignore it, myself included. You know, so it is important, but understand the why, the purpose of why you're doing certain things. Why did you start the Big Seance podcast besides you being a paranormal nerd? You know, there's Mm -hmm. there's 
there's layers beyond layers of why you did these things or why you had the urge or I feel that the universe guided you in this direction. Yet you had it, you were enthusiastic about it and that has sustained you. But I've listened to your podcast since 2014 and I've come across some interviews, even with the Ouija, Karen with the Ouija board. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't touch a Ouija board for nothing in my life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I wouldn't, and even still right to this day, I wouldn't. But she she opened my eyes to a different perspective. Like, you know what? It is a card piece of cardboard, just like tarot cards. So when, when I've had someone make a sly remark, that's no me. And they're like, oh, you know, you're going to hell. I said, oh, I'm going to hell for touching a piece of a paper just like. You know, I don't want to go down that route. I'm just like other books are a certain piece of paper. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with the information. It's your intent. Mm -hmm. And Karen, I'm not sure, her name is Karen, right? Uh huh. Karen Dahlman. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, she really, um, how do I say, she really opened my eyes to the whole, you know, working with the Ouija board. Would I do it? I mean, it's just not, that's not a modality that I choose to use, but I understand it's your intent. And whatever you do, whether it is a Ouija board, whether it is uh, a deck of cards, even, I'm going to say, even if you use uh, the good book, the Bible, it's your intent. You always want to have a clear, you always want to have some type of divine protection around you just so you have a clear mind, you come with clear intentions, good intentions, and that you get the message that's of the highest and best that you need, whatever tool that you use. Tarot, Ouija, uh, pendulums. You know, I use pendulums. Have you used a pendulum before? I have not. It, I've I've always that's on my list. Like you know, every now and then I want to. I find a new toy, a toy or tool that I feel like I have to experiment with, but I haven't. I haven't gotten that one yet. So I used a pendulum before, and with that one, for me, it's been tricky with me. Not like I, it was a trickster spirit, but I, sometimes I feel like my I'm influenced in, in, in a way. Even though I will be stand still, have my arm to the point where it starts aching and hurting because you're trying, to, <laughs> you know. So either with so whether it's with the pendulum, a crystal ball, whatever you use, crystals, gemstones, whatever, you just you still have to have pure good intentions what are in clear intentions and protect yourself and no matter what modality that you use you know so like i said even with your your podcast you've brought on guests um Eve, um, the one that had the tama streferson as spirit guy like i listened to your podcast oh, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah even her and i went back and listened to her podcast so your your platform has opened uh, shipped a lot of uh, gave gave me a lot of insight personally, and I'm sure if you've gotten feedback from your readers where it's giving them insight and helps shift perspectives. So there's always a purpose of why we do certain things. You know, even those who are UFO enthusiasts. You know, sometimes you know it's made to other people, and I, I used to really steer clear from the UFO because it just never really appealed to me in, until last mm-hmm. year. Um, you never. They probably, you know, are in that field to bring awareness to that because my my model, especially within the last two to three years, is truth is stranger than fiction. So what you see is more than what you see that meets the eye. So, you know, it's like you might as well. I always tell, be open. Even I have conversation with my family and, and friends. And sometimes the way they look at me about certain things, paranormal experiences, UFL experiences, Patrick, and they will look at me like I have two heads. I'm like, mm-hmm. no, but you guys don't understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even look at what you, look at what's on the news. It it make it doesn't make any sense. It's like, how did we get here? Well, this is just this is barely the beginning. Mm-hmm. I'm just waiting for a UFO disclosure personally. And I never thought I would say this, but I'm just waiting for that. I'm waiting for ghosts to make themselves more apparent. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just waiting for this to be, and you know, integrated into our daily normal lives. And I think mm-hmm. people like you, people those who are UFO um, enthusiasts, you're just bringing awareness to it, so people become more open. So mm-hmm. when it does happen and it becomes more irregular, they're not freaked out of their skin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's funny you're you're talking about Karen Dahlman. Um, one of my questions was going to be that you refer to yourself as an alchemist. And Karen Dahlman, we've talked to her about alchemy and, and it's one of those, I don't know, I must have this brain block about alchemy or I'm trying to think about it too hard or too literally, but that's one thing that always, I struggle to even understand what that is. 
How, what do you mean by, you know, referring to yourself as an alchemist? It's about, so basically just a quick, it's, it's something that came from the medieval. And I think a little bit before a medieval that predates chemistry or was kind of like the forefather chemistry. And it was about turning lead into gold. They, you, they worked with certain metal metals to break it down and to transform it into certain, to another um, like they broke down lead, lead into a certain powder form that turns it into gold, that whole thing. Um, but what I, how I approach alchemy is understanding that it's a breaking down of a, it's a process of breaking down of a substance and transforming it into something of a greater value. And that's how I approach, look at alchemy. That's how I define alchemy. And what that means for me is um, spiritual alchemy. You know, you're going through we've all gone through so many, so many things, but I can only speak of myself, uh, where you've gone through a very, a term, a situation that was, a ter- that was, of uh, that was hectic or detrimental or a lot of turmoil. And you, you rise. Some people don't make out of certain situations because it com- becomes very overbearing for them. And there, though, there are those who do come out of these dire situations and they take, from that situation, the lessons, and they turn that into wisdom. That's a form of alchemy because who you were before that situation, who you are afterwards, it's like two completely different individuals because of the expansion of your, the shift of your perspective and the expansion of your consciousness and how you uh, were able to process and integrate the lessons you were able to turn it into wisdom and a bit greater understanding um that you can apply to different aspects of your life uh, that's how i look at personal alchemy spiritual alchemy could, could be something i mean that's almost similar another like i look at it something more mundane maybe career and business alchemy is being in one position transitioning into another career developing there's a lot of people especially because of the of the easy access to the internet, they were in one career, got into the internet and chose or or was laid off and uh, got onto the internet, was able to do some things um, with their business on the internet and are in a totally different career and are thought leaders in their field. There's many, there's many uh, examples of that and they have their own podcasts. I don't know if you ever are familiar with them, like Pat Flynn and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, where he was laid off in the architecture and he, you know, and now he's just, he's doing extremely well, but he was able to take something that was of lead and turn it into gold. Same with business. You start, you start something, um, you start with the idea and you bring into fruition with your research and application and due diligence and understanding that it's not failure, it's only feedback and you're able to pivot and to make something that is sustainable and it's making you money and it's in your living life. And that's, that's alchemy. So yes, there's that whole medieval ancient Rosicrucian aspect of alchemy and, you know, and then, but there's also, like I say, practical mundane alchemy. We're living, you're, we're all alchemists, whether you are aware of it or not. Mm -hmm. So do you kind of, it's just, it's about. I understand it more when you, you describe it. So thinking mm-hmm. about it more like as a metaphor rather mm-hmm. than, I mean, I guess I've gotten too deep with it. Or when I hear people describe it deeply, <laughs> you know, my mind only goes so far in certain places. It can only comprehend <laughs> certain things. And I'm like, what? You know, I think I, I get it now. What is it? Um, I don't want to say the sword, sword in the stone, but the... Uh, I'm sure you're one of your listeners is like, it's the Knights, it's the Knights. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it's about the, the whole alchemist with uh, finding the taking what's it taking lead into gold and finding a universe, universal elixir of life. The mm-hmm. what is it that what's Tom, what's the Tom Hanks movie, Da Vinci Code, where they were yeah. trying to find the hidden grail? Yes, mm-hmm. the hidden grail that mm-hmm. has some something to do with alchemy, also finding the. The answer to what life is. Secrets. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Seeking to what is the answer of life? What is the answer of the universe? And that answer is within us. Mm -hmm. That's why I personally believe it's like we, you know, that's another thing. We always are seeking externally for answers. And that's another thing what I do with my coaching and why I built the platforms that I do. I'm all about seeking the answers within. That's all. 
Um, and then have a little help with your friends, physical or non-physical. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a, um, and that's another thing. I just I want people to understand it's normal, you know, because this is here. I look at it. When I, eventually, when I pass on a die, hopefully that's in my nineties or around a hundred. So I'm not putting out the universe, but eventually, when I do pass on a die, <laughs> I don't want to be looked at as some ghost. I want to. I want people. I'm very much real. That's why I tell. I always say they're not dead people. They're not. They may not be in the physical, but they're not dead. They're very much alive. They're in a different dimension or a different form they're very much alive they're very much aware and uh, real they're very much a- aware of what's going on in this plane of existence and then in your line just as much uh, life and just as much as they're aware of what's going on in their plane of existence so they may look at us as dead because we're not our minds are not open mm-hmm. you know <laughs> to yeah. the multi you know to the layers of existence so I just want to say, I just I just want to say this on your show because I know people are open it. They're not dead. Mm-hmm. I just not gonna... <laughs> so you are going to a place where I get kind of nerdy, you know, talking about uh, people aren't dead and that you know you know they need respect just like everybody else. They're who they were when they were here in physical. But I'm curious, and I like to ask this question often: What do you think we are gonna find? on the other side, that moment when we cross over from everything that you know, from all the energies that you have, have talked to, um, from your divination, you know, Mm. what are we going to find on the other side in your opinion? Mm. You know, I don't know, but I know it's real. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a matter of fact, last night when I was asleep, one of the episodes, the episode with Chris, you know that I spoke in that we were talking about uh-huh. the different clairvoyance, clairaudience. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Chris so, Medina. Yes. Chris Medina that was on this on this podcast. And I I think his his predominant Claire is uh clairvoyance. I'm more clairaudience. Mm-hmm. So I know that there is a real there's a there's a place <laughs> that's um, when mm-hmm. we leave this plane um because i do hear i do hear things um not just in my head but also where i feel like it's outside of my head mm-hmm. where someone's talking to my ear as a matter of fact i just had experience last night and i had a, one last week where i was deep in sleep and it was i was thinking about like okay what we're we gonna talk about today on on, on your show and I kept, I was asking my spirit guides, um, I said, well, is there a message that you want to tell Patrick and his, the readers? I'm like, if you guys want me to say, if not, then I'll just keep my mom. Because I'm, I'm not a medium and I don't come claim to be a psychic. I'm more intuitive. Uh-huh. So <laughs> I just want to make put that out there. Uh-huh. But I do, like I said, I do communicate with my spirit guides like I'm talking or texting to them. So, um, and I talked to them like they're next to me. And I said, you, you mentioned one time you said like you're on Google Hangouts and I <laughs> almost peed my pants. I thought that was so funny that you're chilling out with your ancestors and spirit guides on Google Hangouts. That's yeah. awesome. I'd love that. Oh, that is, would be amazing. I, so it is. Um, but I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. And um, I heard like they like they were excited, like, you know, and I and I and I was in deep sleep and I said, well, Who's whispering and saying in my ear? And I was like, normally I'll go and turn on the light because it, it still it still shocks you, especially when you're in deep sleep uh-huh. and you're hearing your name. I've heard my name over and over again. I've heard um, just just noises where it's you're in and I get them when I'm in deep sleep and I and I'll pop out and I'm like, well, who said that? So but this um, yesterday I just heard like a and I felt like a tapping on my shoulder and I woke up and I was like. Okay, I don't feel I'm not I'm not gonna I don't feel scared, so I know it's not some other entity. So, and then last week I heard of a I heard a la 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 right behind my bed my head, <laughs> and I look I said I know that because I'm like the dog and the cat are not here, and I was like ah. Uh. So yes, I do know that there is another plane of existence. What I feel, what I think is over there. Um, I think, you know what, I do think there is a, I don't know what the right terminology, I I do think there's an equivalent to what this earthly existence looks like, Mm -hmm. but not so dense. Yeah. I do think it's vast and and forever going, 
just like I think there is equivalent of the spiritual or the astral, or, you know, some people might say astral, from, from other planets. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just the Earth that only exists, uh, equivalent of the Earth that only exists. This is a vast, this is something we can't even... Let's be honest, none of us have been outside of this planet. Right. <laughs> you know, so who knows what's really out there? But I do think that there are spiritual and astral equivalents to um, those um, those planets, just like there are spiritual and astral equivalents to the earthly um, earth plane, but not as dense. And what I mean, this is like where we're going to be able to touch it and, and throw it. You know, that's what I do know for sure in the depths of my soul, but what it looks like, I can just only go by what I've read about near death experiences. My, my sister has had um, a near death experience in the nineties and I've heard her explanation, what she felt she saw an experience when she was in a coma for six months, six, seven months. And what it is, is like vibrant colors. Things were forever going. They had buildings. So I, like I said, I do, you know, and even just encounters when I've gotten readings from mediums, like even when I got a reading from Chris, you know, mm-hmm. he, he, my dad was basically right. He didn't know it was my dad, but my dad was right there and he was in Chris was, cause I'm sharing this story, but <laughs> I was like, yeah. but it's my, but he was, Chris was giving me a message from my spiritual guides and I got a lot of confirmation about a particular spirit guide that I work with. And he described her and I said, well, I feel that she doesn't, look i said it's very hard it's not like i want some exotic she's an exotic spirit but she's exotic and um she doesn't look human but she is human he says she's some type of different type of being and i accepted that what it is because i don't think humans are the only thing that humanoids you know when i say human human beings Mm -hmm. are the only type of beings that do exist i do think there are other type of beings that do exist but we're very ignorant to it just how we are conditioned. So I was right. So I know that, you know, she's very real and the rest of my spirit guides are real. And even my dad was near Chris and um, he was all up in the reading telling Chris to tell me, listen to what your spirit guides are telling you. Cause there were some things that they were telling me about mm-hmm. this year and even next year that I need to prepare for. And that the, this year was a year of clarity. So I, like I said, I do know that exists. I do know those planes exist. What it looks like, I, I don't want to lie to you because I'll probably just be going by near death experience account <laughs> recountments that I've read. Right. Well, we all have that. You know, we read about things, and then that affects kind of what we what we know or what we think. Mm-hmm. So you talk a lot about speaking of you know chilling with your guides and ancestors on google hangouts which makes me incredibly jealous um Mm -hmm. you know you said you made a comment that you know people might not want to necessarily contact all of your ancestors because you said some of them just have some ish of their own (laughs) and that does not need to be (laughs) brought up what what do you mean what do you mean by that um i do believe that in some type of way you do when you do pass back to the world of spirit, um, there is remnants of who you are, the, who you were in this most recent uh, lifetime. And I, for the record, I do believe in incarnation. I didn't believe that first when I was growing up. Um, a lot of that was doctrines that were passed down to me. But uh, from my own experiences, I do believe in incarnation. I do believe that... Um, when you do pass on, you do have remnants from, like I said, your most recent experience. Case in point, I do have an uncle who wasn't the, I didn't know him. He died before I was born. But from the stories, my mom and my aunts and just his ex-wife has told me that dude was, he was a piece of work. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Uh-huh. And I and I got into, uh, this is again my personal experience. And, and then my, also my grandfather, he died way when my mom was 15. So that was in like in the 50s. And so I didn't know him. And I also heard stories about him. So I got into, and, and this has worked for me. This is part of my spiritual practice that I've been using is I give honor to my spiritual guides, spiritual teachers, my ancestors. And I burn something called ancestor money. Maybe some people in your audience have heard of that. Um, 
it it's probably from the the Asian culture. I think it's the Chinese tradition where when their relatives die or friends die, they they get this, I forgot, I don't know what the right term is. It's not ancestor money. It's not the right term. It's a certain paper they get. And it's like, they, it looks like money. It looks. It's not monopoly money, but it looks like money. And they burn it at the funerals and or at anniversaries of their death or of birthdays. So I was like, okay, that, and that was, it, for me, money is energy. So whatever, when you're burning, now the alchemy is when you're turning, you're burning something from paper and it turns into dust and you see the smoke rising in the the ethers that's a form of energy not saying that they need the money on the other side because i don't think they really have currency like that but it is a form of energy and a sign of for me respect and honoring your of their presence of what they've done in my life so i was starting i was like oh that is when i was researching and seeing other people do it and just seeing some of the responses they've gotten back in from those in the sport of spirit i was just like that's something I'm going to try and incorporate. So I got, when I first, I was like, oh, I'm going to write ancestors running for, uh, not just my, all my spiritual guides, cosmic. I always say my uh, my ancestors, my blood ancestors, my cosmic ancestors, because just in case I have a cosmic origin, I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> like, oh, my galactic. And those ancestors of the land that we live upon. So those indigenous individuals. And then I have some for my guides. And so I was writing individuals for my aunts, uh, for my, um, like, my father, my my aunt, my grandmother. I said, oh, I'm even going to do it for my grandfather and my uncle. And then I just realized, I'm like, I kept hearing in the back of my head, don't invite people into your life that you don't know too much about especially if they have troubled past because you don't know because I always still you're still developing in the mm-hmm. world of spirit you're still mm-hmm. going through it's very much a lot we're like I said they're very much alive as they were here in the physical and if you understand physical there's always a life lesson behind your experience so you either grow or you don't we all know people who have bumped their head against bricks walls and still haven't figured it out. But anyways, <laughs> you know, and that's the same in the world of spirit. And so I kept hearing, just kept hearing in the back of my mind, do not invite individuals, whether they're related to you by blood or not, into your life that you aren't familiar with, that you have not even made it, meditated upon or whatever. And I just kept hearing about that. And from what I just was hearing by different, different people's stories and research you know, we're hearing different reading about stories that some people are still the same that they are in the word of spirit as they are in the spiritual because they haven't fully understand the effects that they've they've caused in people's lives in the physical plane. They they haven't learned that lesson. They don't fully understand, and they're still in that energy sin- signature. So not everybody grows a pair of wings yeah. to be this godly angel when they cross over yeah and, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that they're in hell or whatever you know that that realm of hell that some people you know do mm-hmm. believe do exist so but just some people are still in their own they had they're still in their own funk mm-hmm. and is that the type of energy that you need to, and it's inner energy is very powerful you don't see it but it has a it has a, a, an effect on our lives. And is that what you want to bring into your life? So I was like, let me stop. I know my grandmothers. I know my dad. I know my aunt. And I know my great aunt. Other people, I honor you. I respect you. I pray for you. But I don't know you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? No, but that's a different experience if my mom... And my other aunts, they wanted to call upon my uncle and their dad because they know them. I don't know. And they know what they're dealing with but because of stories I've heard. It's just like, I don't know if they learned the lesson. I don't know, you know, if they they really understood and they've grown from it in their own way in the spirit world. And really, I don't want to take the chance. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so that that's, that's my whole thing about just being mindful of who you are who you draw like even like the story where chris mentioned on your podcast about the lady that was calling upon any spirits because it was a safe heaven i'm an introvert and i don't know about you guys but i don't even like people stopping by without giving me a call (laughs) you know i'm about family and friends give me a call or a heads up so i can at least straighten up the house a little bit you know or get mentally prepared so why would you do that if you don't why would you invite any type of spirit and not all things spirituals of, of, of the higher vibration let's keep it real why would you invite that into your sacred space mm-hmm. you have to be mindful 
you know, because yeah. yeah, you don't want people putting their feet up on the couch and dirting up your rugs. You don't want this, like, you know, you wouldn't want that. So why you don't want them dirting up your energetic space? I mean, there's not enough sage in the world that can really clear all that out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to give you a sneak peek at part two of my conversation with Danielle. Let me give you a tip on contacting your spirit guides. We all have them. Can I just give a couple of tips? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because I really, I I really want people just to be open. And since you have an audience that is already receptive because they're listening to this podcast about paranormal experiences, they're already receptive. So I'm out there. Let's do it. Okay. And we had an argument and I just felt like me, us having a conversation, we wasn't getting anywhere. I would write letters to their higher selves or to their spirit guides. Like, Shut can, you inter- <laughs> can you intervene in this? Because this is not working. <laughs> oh my God, that concept is awesome. If you can develop self-love and compassion for yourself and develop a better relationship with yourself and an understanding of yourself and how you fit in this world, think I aim and hope that we can have a better understanding of others and their walks of lives without really, truly judging them to the core. And I'm I'm feeling this. The way I'm getting the message is that words are coming in my head and I'm feeling a presence. So they're saying, please let Patrick's audience know. And the opportunity for this, I'm pulling from my tarot deck. So this is from an oracle deck. Um, I love doing this. And until next time, namaste. There you go. That's what I was looking for. I love the way you say it. It's awesome. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel. I think I've mentioned before that some of my favorite ghost reports are those that give a significant history to the haunted house or whatever the haunted site might be. A lot of times these articles are pretty sketchy. You don't really know who or what the ghost is. There's just weird stuff happening. But here's an article that gives a very substantial background to the haunting. It was published on May 7th of 1891 in the St. John's Herald, a newspaper from Arizona, and the headline is, A Musical Phantom, Violin Solos by a Ghost That Haunts a Mine. The strange story told of a deserted cabin down in Alabama, sweet strains from an invisible musician. Down in the abandoned Arbicucci gold mines, 20 miles south of Edwardsville, Alabama, says the Pittsburgh Dispatch, stands the ruins of a log cabin where years ago a mysterious and bloody crime was committed. The place is haunted, but not by visible ghosts. No white-robed phantom forms walk with noiseless tread across the broken vine-covered floor of the old cabin. No specter lights gleam through the one window or across the rotten threshold of the shutterless door. The ghost is heard, not seen, and no one who has once heard the sounds that come from the old cabin at midnight will ever again doubt the existence of spooks. The ghostly sounds are the music of a violin. The playing is not that of a master, but it is good, and it is soft and low, as though the soul of the player was in sympathy with his music. Night after night, for many years, this ghostly violin, played by ghostly hands, has awakened the echoes of the deserted cabin. First, there is heard the thrumming on the strings, a tuning of the instrument, and then the bow is drawn across the strings when they are all in perfect harmony. A sweet Scottish love ballad of olden days is first played. Then comes the familiar music of the Scots Highland Fling. Then there is a brief pause, another thrumming of the strings, and then on the night air softly floats the music of that old Scottish song within a mile o' Edinburgh town. One stanza is finished, another is begun. The music is softer, sweeter than before, when suddenly it stops in the middle of a bar and is heard no more until the following night, when the same program is repeated. 
Of course, there is a story attached to the old cabin, a story to explain the ghostly music, and a weird story it is. In 1868, when the Arbicucci gold mines were filled with prospectors, two old California miners turned up there one day. Their names were Martin Burke and Daniel McLeod. They were past middle life and had been mining in California and Nevada for 20 years with indifferent success. McLeod was a Scotchman, and to the newly discovered gold mine he brought an old violin, which he never tired of playing when asked to perform. The two miners rented the cabin and went to work prospecting among the hills. They had been there only a few weeks when other miners and prospectors noticed they went out early in the morning, always going in the same direction, and did not return till night. Many suspected they had struck it rich somewhere in the hills, but as no one else had been able to find gold in paying quantities, it was finally agreed that Burke and McLeod were merely following some blind lead. One day the two men were missing. Next day they were still missing, and the cabin was visited. The dead body of McLeod was lying on the floor of the cabin. He had been shot through the head while sitting in front of the fire playing his violin. When he fell, his fingers stiffened on his violin, and when in removing them from the dead man's hands, the bow was drawn across the strings by accident. The old fiddle emitted a wail for the dead musician, which, it is stated, made those who heard it shudder. Burke was gone and naturally he was suspected of the murder of his partner. There seemed to be but one reasonable theory of the crime, that the two men had made a rich find, that Burke had murdered his companion, and taking all the gold, had fled. The theory was generally accepted, but as there was no positive evidence against Burke, no effort was made to find him. None dared to charge him with the murder of McLeod because they had no evidence. Burke spent his days and nights in the one saloon of the little town. About that time, the ghostly violin playing in the old cabin was first heard, and one night a frightened countryman was giving an account of it in the saloon at Arbicucci. Burke heard the story, and it was noticed that he turned deadly pale, and staggering to the bar called for a glass of liquor. From that night, Burke drank more and more, and in a week he was on the verge of the gym jams. Late one night, he reeled up to the bar and called for liquor. A crowd of countrymen were drinking in the back room, and one of them was playing a violin. Burke paid no attention to the music at first, but just as he raised the glass to his lips, the country fiddler began to play Within a Mile, O Edinburgh Town. The glass of liquor fell from Burke's trembling fingers, and with a gasp he fell to the floor. The look of terror on the man's face was one never to be forgotten. He fell all in a heap, and in five minutes he was dead. The doctors said he died of heart failure caused by drink and sudden excitement. Feels like there's a little bit of folktale in this ghost report, and I think that quite a few of these ghost reports are at least a little bit folktale. I'm Tim Prossel, and you've been listening to Spectral Edition. I have close to 300 of these ghost reports. I post one each Wednesday on my website. That website is called The Merry Ghost Hunter, M-E-R-R-Y, Ghost Hunter. I hope you stop by sometime. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. It's been a while since I've read some listener feedback, so I've got quite a few to be thankful for in the last month. I'm going to do my best on this one, but Otsunashi or Otsunashi from the USA iTunes store titles their comment, a paranormal podcast that's above the rest. I've been binge listening to this most awesome podcast. It is above most other paranormal podcasts. It's very upbeat and least frou-frou of many podcasts I've listened to. That's funny. Subject matter is within the spiritual, and it doesn't dwell in the darker aspects of the paranormal. Patrick Keller is very articulate and upbeat, conversationalist. His guests are as upbeat and articulate as he is. I hope him and his paranormal podcast, the big seance podcast, the best 
and keep up the good work. Uh, Pat LaCrosse from the USA iTunes store also says, great show, no complaints. Awesome. Short and sweet. Kate Main from the USA iTunes store says, love his podcast, top-notch podcast, a wonderful host, and great stories. Thanks so much for working so hard on this podcast. Jennifer DeWald on the USA iTunes store says, I learn something every time I listen. Mr. Keller does an amazing job of hosting a variety of guests and subject matters. Truly, I learn something every time I listen to the podcast. His interview questions are thought-provoking and ones I would ask myself if I had the chance to be in a room with his guests. I appreciate the variety of subject matters. Each one is interesting to me and helps me to learn more about the world of the paranormal. I have told several friends about this great podcast and will continue to spread the word. Thanks for spreading the word, Jennifer. Corin007 from the U.S. iTunes store says intelligent conversations over tea and coffee. Patrick does a great job of culturing an atmosphere of roundtable conversations about the paranormal with big and small names in the field. If you ever wondered if a Ouija board would burn your house down or if the mystery of Flight 19 wasn't so cut and dry, this is the place to be. Now, I have to be honest. I'm thinking maybe Corin007 is thinking of another podcast because I don't know about Flight 19. I'd love to know about Flight 19. I think maybe I know what that Flight 19 thing is about, but I'm I'm quite certain we haven't um, discussed it in a podcast. So, Corin, you might want to let me know. Dame E gave us a review in the Canadian iTunes store recently. And Dame E says, fabulous, great host, great topics and guests, very well produced, takes a thoughtful approach to all things paranormal. Thank you to all of those folks who gave great reviews in iTunes. I feel like I just, all of the reviews in iTunes are just great gifts. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me in the parlor today. Don't forget to join us in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook to continue the discussion. You guys rock. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Tune in radio and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755 Tell Me. That's 775 583 5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time.